Actually, I, I want to I like a story to begin things with. I want to like warn both the viewers and uh, our lovely guest and Hakim that uh, right before the episode, <laughs> I ate a dinner. I don't know, in different parts of the world, they call it a kebab, <laughs> they call it something else. And basically, it's, I don't know, a Middle Eastern taco for our uh, American uh, listeners. <laughs> Hakim is probably going to castrate me for what I just said. <laughs> but no, I, I, I went and I bought uh, two dinners because, oh, I'm going to eat. Mm. And then my girlfriend's also going to eat. And then she arrives uh, home from work and she says, she says, no, I just had dinner. So I ended up eating mm. two XL uh, dinners, which is literally around <laughs> 800 grams to a kilo worth of very, very greasy food. So now even as I am talking, <laughs> Walking, I can feel my like my my energy leaving my body, and I'm sweating like crazy because that thing like really wants to go out. So I am uh, okay. uh, just in advance warning both of viewership, our guest and Hakim, that if you like hear me just like <laughs> zone out or die, it's like the Duner uh, <laughs> the Duner conquering my body. It's not uh, it's not uh, intentional. I'm gonna be very it's offended perfect. if you fall asleep while I'm talking, yeah. so I take it personally. Hell yeah, there you go. I have some motivation. Yeah, I have exactly. some. No, trust you me. When you're first. talking, you I will definitely me. Do that. I, who, who, <laughs> Whose TikToks do you think I was watching while eating the dinner? I, that was more int intended mm. towards Hakeem and his like 20 minute rants, which you will probably now witness. <laughs> and, and usually, like, I, I, I'm very energized during our podcast because I take naps while Hakeem is talking. Then I wake because up. Drink. And, like, JT is like my <laughs> alarm. He, he wakes me up and I, and I continue talking. Um, yes, hello everybody. Uh, today we have a lovely guest um, to introduce, uh, Lady Istihar, which uh, for those who are interested, Istihar means to, to flourish or to thrive uh, in Arabic, although Persians use that name a bit oh, more often, which is what? an interesting side now. Thank you for explaining. <laughs> Thank you for, everyone's always confused about my name. I, I appreciate having you <laughs> to say that. But yes, uh, yeah. my name is Izdahar and I am mm. a historian or historical researcher on Eastern Europe and Russia, but I primarily focus on um, former Soviet states and cultural or ethnographic history. Um, and you can find me everywhere on the internet under Lady Izdahar. Exactly right. One thing that she forgot from her description was that she's an ab an absolute all round Chad because of the the uh, never ending bullshit that she gets from all uh, ends uh, of, of the uh, all, all sides of the political spectrum. Oh my god! Every um, angle: in, people who hate Muslims, yeah. Muslims who hate communists, <laughs> people who hate women, yeah. everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So um, we we salute you for your service and. <laughs> Thank but you. yeah, uh, uh, the people uh, listening will notice that there is a severe dearth of the uh, our favorite good boy uh, JT, and that's because he has um, uh, some family responsibilities, so he couldn't join us for today. This won't be a uh, recurring thing uh, that often. Every once in a while, one of us might be missing because we just absolutely couldn't make it. Um, so yeah, uh, th this is not an issue, nor is it an, an, an insult to lady. He, it's not like he was like, I, I absolutely refuse to be on on board if she's if she's the guest. No, no, uh, nothing of the sort. Uh, like just too many Muslims in this that. podcast already. <laughs> one, two now. But, oh my I was god, gonna say, my white yeah. soul cannot I, take it. Oh, oh my god, wait, wait, hold on. I'm so sorry, Hakim. Assalamu alaikum. I'm so sorry. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. It's perfectly, perfectly fine. We exchanged salams in the email, so it's fine. It carries over, don't worry. Okay, we're good. <laughs> we're not but going yeah, to hell, um, we're it, good. Yes. Uh, I was going to say, it feels good to, for, for, for um, what's it called, the, the, the program to now be a uh, Muslim majority podcast, okay? Yes. So, um, uh, you go Nake. I'm gonna I'm gonna need you to pay the jizzy tax now. And so <laughs> you're gonna oh, get back. some some, some options. It took me 500 years, I mean, I, and now I'm back even in my own podcast. God damn it! Uh, it's fine. I, I, I need. I'm. I'm gonna need some Christian boys to 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 take to make into Janissaries. All right. So okay, I'll give you two of my <laughs> sons. Is it too much? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. See, now I'm comfortable. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. All right. History. History huh? repeats itself. Convert or die. Yeah. We're gonna be okay. Exactly. First as a tragedy, second as force, uh, and third time as comedy, apparently. Anyways, uh, so uh, today is going to be a very general discussion of uh, the ethnic, well, 
experience in, in, in the Soviet Union um, because we have a actually educated person amongst us for once. It's not just my dumb ass talking or Yukopnik's very beautiful ass talking, but uh, we have a, a third person who is uh, directly related and educated in, in the in the matters that we're going to be discussing. Yeah, please do introduce yourself. Of course. Okay, yes, I am Lady Izdahar, but what, what do I do on the internet? Because um, that's kind of a big a big thing right there. Um, first and foremost, I hate traditional academia. And I think there is a huge mm. problem in accessibility Based. with traditional academia. Um, it's gatekept by it being incredibly expensive in the United States specifically. This is more of an American, like a United States centric mm. sort of thing because it's more accessible in other parts of the world. Um, but it's gatekept monetarily um, and also it's gatekept linguistically. Uh, in many ways, if you can afford to either go to university or um, get documents that have all the answers, it, the chances are it's going to be hard to understand what they're even saying. And so a lot of what I'm doing online kind of stemmed from my anger towards the way that traditional academia censors um, people talking about the Soviet Union or Eastern Europe in general in the English language. And also it's a it's a way I challenge the way that um, it's spoken about in general in English because you do not find information about um, Soviet people without every single horrible thing that's ever happened in the history of the Soviet Union and every horrible thing that's happened to its people. Uh, you can't find anything without all of that interjected. And so I openly am biased. I am very open about that. I put out positive or interesting or lesser known information about Eastern European, Russian, Soviet history without all of the horror and trauma. And some people don't like it because they think I need to add all of that, but I'm biased and I admit that. And that's kind of my purpose is I feel like there's a, there's this sort of narrative is missing that everything you hear is negative. And if you do hear something positive, it's like some dumbass not addressing things properly. <laughs> and so I want to create a space where people can learn about interesting aspects of the Soviet Union and Soviet people and Russian history and not have to hear about how horrible everything was all the time. Yeah, exactly right. So TLDR stalling eight babies. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, that's very, very, uh, I think it's a great thing that you're doing because the gatekeeping aspect uh, of, or gatekeeping aspect of academia is definitely, um, especially for somebody outside the United States, as, such as myself, if I'm looking for something, it becomes even like twice the difficulty because I don't even have access to uh, possible libraries that may exist in the US that, you know, have the relevant stuff that I might need. Um, but yeah, it's very normal, by the way, as an example, for example, um, if you want to, it's a small, let's say, excerpt of some particular work, and it just so happens to be like, oh, it was printed in 1972 or something, um, and it's published by Routledge or something, and it's $600, or even more, sometimes like 2500 for like a paperback with 120 pages. It's insane. Absolutely. What? So it's a very... Sorry, go on. Oh, so like even when you have like academic papers by historians who've talked about these topics, even their papers suck because they have to maintain a certain yeah. narrative to be funded course, for working. Yeah. And, you know, the mm. narrative that's going to be published in English is never going to be mm. in favor of a more, you know, Marxist perspective. Exactly. Yeah. I, 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 my favorite example of that. Sorry, sorry, you Nick. Uh, I'm just gonna say my thing, and then you can just interject. Go, go, go. But my favorite example of that, would you? Thank you, Abibi. Um, is uh, the uh, if you are familiar with um, uh, J. Arch Getty's work on on the Great Purges, um, on his book on the Great Purges, there is a multi-page preface at the very beginning where he apologizes profusely. For the, he's like, I promise I'm not a Marxist, I'm not a Stalinist, I believe in capitalism, the Soviet Union was absolutely horrible, blah, blah, all this like multi-page, you know, apologizing profusely for the fact that the data has shown that the Great Purges weren't some fucking, you know, oh, you know, Stalin at his desk, fucking just checking, fucking <laughs> playing Among Us, <laughs> and then whoever, whoever gets vented is the guy who's going to be fucking executed, I don't know, what's, right? Uh, it wasn't some comical, you know, it was an actual, there was actual uh, struggle within the uh, party, uh, within the um, uh, internal security apparatus of the Soviet Union, and there was aspects that the Soviet government, that truly did believe in socialism and all that stuff, wasn't entirely aware of. They didn't know what was going on. There was a lot of confusion, blah, right, blah, blah, all that right. kind of stuff. So basically, it wasn't a directed effort of malice against the, ooh, the fucking... Right. Um, and uh, yeah, he, he just, all of it is just apologies for like six pages, um, which I find very interesting. No other academic work, including work on Nazis, by the way. 
has this sort of shit in it, which is very interesting. Sorry, Gopnik, you want to say something? I just wanted to comment on uh, the importance of your work, especially from a perspective of a relatively proud Eastern European such as myself, because I noticed <laughs> one specific aspect of it uh, when it comes to your work versus whenever anybody else is covering Eastern Europe, and especially now uh, with the current uh, crisis slash tragedy raging on uh, is that it's always uh, seen through the spectrum of as you both said uh, the tra certain tragedies which did occur on the territory and it is always sold as a land on which uh, there is just constant death and suffering and nothing else exists pretty much the way I don't know African Americans are pissed off that the only representation they see in like movies that are made about times before I don't know in the 1960s or 70s is usually directed by a white guy and it's only showing them as slaves. Same with Eastern Europeans, you know, we're these uh, drunk, alcoholic, wife-beating uh, marauders who uh, <laughs> use any system which comes uh, to our territory to uh, kind of uh, criminalize it and use it against the uh, oppressed uh, masses which do not actually want it and yet in some specific way are also corrupt. So we ruined communism and then uh, capitalism came, but because <laughs> Because uh, <laughs> these uh, whites who are white, but not really, depending on the narrative, and they're on our side, and they're pretty white like the Polish, but oh my God, the orcish Russian hordes now are very Asiatic, you know? It's mm -hmm. always it's always mm -hmm. bundled up in, uh, in kind of, let's call it, historical baggage, which uh, not, is not always bundled with a person who, for example, is talking about French culture, or German, or or English there it's you know it's the it's the art it's the clothes it's the food it's the smells it's the experience and when you're talking about uh, anything east of Warsaw it's those things but uh, also starvation murder destruction genocide and etc etc et it's wrapped in in the idea that it is a part of that part of the world while it not necessarily is on the other and you with your absolutely beautifully biased uh, approach, I wouldn't call it biased, I would actually call that unbiased approach to talking about that part of the world, you're actually showing very specific cases, instances, and not only that, but uh, segments of experience that many people do have uh, over here, which you do not wrap in all the chaos, and therefore deliver actual interesting information uh, to people who might not be from here and give them a much closer experience to what it is like to be from Eastern Europe and be of many different ethnicities and cultures than uh, what a rando academic that uh, visited Moscow for a week in 1998 uh, can ever tell them. Right. And I, and I think what you're trying to say as well is like, it's incredibly dehumanizing the way that other people try to discuss it, even when they're perhaps well-meaning in their preface or in their um, desire to define people by their tragedies. Um, and as you mentioned, like, it's such a complex, Eastern Europe is so complex. I think a lot of people are always confused about me and my background. People either think I'm Russian or they think that I am from the Levant for some reason. Um, but as as I think we mentioned, I'm a convert to Islam, right? And my family actually comes from Eastern Europe. They come from um, the Banat region of Serbia and Romania, and they're Danib Swabians, a German minority, and oh, their history is really depressing. <laughs> um, but it, it just goes to show people don't even know that there's German groups in Eastern Europe and Russia as well, like the Volga Germans. People don't know that it's not just Slavs. People don't know that there's, you know, multiple different religious groups. Um, I think actually there's this really great, um, sorry, I'm, I'm going on and on, but there's this really great- Do, please do, please do. <laughs> so this is very humbling method that some professors like to use when they're teaching a class on a part of the world that is so misunderstood. And what they do is they'll hand out a blank map of the region that the class is about, and they'll give all of the students a minute to try and label it. And of course, every time, no one can label everything there. And I I think it's like it's it's just the perfect example like go ahead like try <laughs> like like see if you can even kind of label this map of, of what eastern europe is and looks like because I, I guarantee you very few people will have any actual idea of who is there and you know what they practice and, and who they are 
absolutely couldn't agree more. And in situations like uh, uh, like these, which we are experiencing right now, when it's much more, when the much a much larger portion of media sees potential profit motives which lead them to covering these areas with greater intensity. You see a lot of people that uh, in that same class would have a very difficult job marking absolutely anything, trying to uh, sell themselves off as uh, experts and so on. And we've talked on this podcast many times about uh, quote-unquote Western experts that uh, live uh, uh, from uh, from the idea that uh, they only are able to understand certain parts of the world and we shouldn't actually go and ask those people from over there but what 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 we are seeing is uh, is just like in every single uh, conflict zone or every single uh, kind of uh, fire that starts brewing anywhere at any point uh, in history and especially since the modern kind of uh, media apparatus has existed we see that uh, they they rarely actually go and talk to people which uh, have uh, a a broader and less um, what word should i use less paparazzi less uh, explosive overview and analysis of these of these places and concentrate on those with much more explosive rhetoric about uh, you know why certain things are going on etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's why voices like yours are super important because you actually get to talk about it without uh, uh, without trying to turn it into another article from the yellow pages or some shit Right. And I, I hate to like call myself an expert. Like I do devote much of my time in life to this, but I'm, I'm still young. I don't know everything. Um, but I try and I try, I think I associate most of my, the way that I approach things and, and the way that I'm empathetic towards understanding these people, I kind of hone it in more on the fact I was raised by like, my family is all like punk rock counterculture, people. <laughs> like I grew up going to rock concerts and all of our friends are like the misfits of society kind of thing. And I actually associate um, my my methods to that, like having this innate um, empathy for the misunderstood and misrepresented in society. And that's something that led me towards communism. And it's something that led me towards Islam. And it's something that plays a heavy part in the work that I do is having that, that deep empathy for the misunderstood and frustration for the misrepresented. Exactly right. Um, and I believe something that we can segue into nicely is uh, how both of those uh, virtues um, and how you identify with the weak and downtrodden were severely tested by your experience with the American liberal establishment, uh, which you had some interesting oh. experiences with, <laughs> can we say? Uh, could you please enlighten us um, to whatever degree you're comfortable letting us know? Uh, what was that about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, my background uh, initially was actually in, in government poli politics. Well, not really. Like I've always been super interested in history and uh, political geography and vexillology, the study of flags. I collect like maps and flags and I have for a very, very long time. Um, but when I went to college, I on the side got a TEFL certificate to teach English as a foreign language. And I hated it. I hated teaching and I thought I, I never want to teach ever again. But it's not the case. I just hated teaching English. And so I changed my major from, from studying history to studying political science and global affairs. And in a very selfish, very gross past is the heart, uh, <laughs> ugh, I don't like thinking about it. I thought instead of teaching history, why don't I become a part of history and go uh, into yes. politics? <laughs> Change the system from the inside. Oh, yes. No, no, no. I should. Okay. That's the thing. I genuinely was drinking that Kool-Aid. I thought that I could change things from the inside. I thought that, and I believed that, and I know so many people genuinely believe that. And it's sad. Um, and so, you know, I ended up working first as like a government affairs person for a Muslim American political organization that uh, is not great. In fact, uh, their whole thing is to create this narrative that um, that Muslims are American too. And you are not allowed to say Muslim mm. or Muslim American. It has to be American Muslim. There has to be a certain amount of American mm. flags in every room. Like we have to be as palatable as possible. And I was perfect for it because they're, oh, you're some tall, young, white Muslim that we can throw on stage to just, you know, <laughs> do our work, right? Um, and then from there, I went and did interfaith lobbying. Oh, God. I was a lobbyist oh, yeah. for How a short fun. time. 
Uh, and again, I, I was so full of self-righteousness. I thought I am doing things. I am going to change things. And then, and then from there, I became a legislative assistant in my state's house of representatives for the most diverse legislative district in my state. And, uh, it was absolute hell and it only radicalized me further. And everyone there is in their own little bubble, and it's awful. The amount, like, again, as a, as a white girl, despite wearing a headscarf, I had not, like, received so many microaggressions until I worked in the government, and no one could tell where I'm from. It was insane. And I have many stories, if you're if you're interested in the kinds of things that I witnessed. Please, yeah. I, I, I want to hear you vent, please. <laughs> Get old hatred out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, I think the only reason they hired me uh, was because I had a headscarf and it looked good in a very diverse legislative district that had quite a few mm -hmm. Muslims in it. I don't think it was based off of my skill or merit because I didn't feel like I had a lot of skills when it came to politics other than public speaking and knowing international mm -hmm. affairs really well and being the most geographically literate person in the whole, mm -hmm. all of the government in Washington state, I would argue. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> they're they don't, they don't know where anything is and it's so frustrating um we are all sorry let me just say this we're all we all inhabit this earth it is our obligation to at least learn the basics of where things are and who lives there so please okay uh, ukraine and iran are the exact same place you can't tell me otherwise <laughs> sorry go on go on <laughs> okay so one thing that I can think of is one of the first things that someone, mind you, I'm working with like really quote unquote important people. They're all liberals. This is the um, Democrat, Democratic side of the Washington state government. And I have people coming up to me saying, oh, like, are you ever going to bring Persian food in for us to eat? And it's like, where the fuck do you think I'm from? Like, first of all, I don't cook. <laughs> Second of all, I'm white. And then you try to explain to these people like, hey, like I'm not Persian, like I'm, I'm white. I'm from this state. I, in fact, most of my family's from Eastern Europe, and they get offended. They're offended on behalf of Arabs, and are like, "You're appropriating <laughs> yeah. Arab culture by wearing that. What oh do you mean God. you're not from the Middle East?" And mind you, Arabs make up 14% of the world Muslim population. It is a world religion and the most converted to religion. So it's not my fault that they're ignorant on Islam. <laughs> um, the state um, attorney general. In Washington, he was really known for being the the guy who like sued Trump for the Muslim ban. And when I was working in government, was when he was like celebrating all of his achievements. And I got this email, and I remember being so pissed off because it was this whole self congratulatory email of "Oh, we did it! We we're 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 successful! We're helping the Muslims, you know, the poor Muslims to celebrate <laughs> our achievements." Uh, you know, we're inviting you, all the people who work in the government, to this celebratory event and you know where the event took place do you want to guess where this event to celebrate the muslim ban was taking place <laughs> oh, oh boy i wonder where a bar yeah there it is a bar. Oh, okay. i saw it coming i saw i saw it coming <laughs> this is something you go think you would do <laughs> uh, absolutely <laughs> oh. no no you, you have the you have the cultural of like uh, uh what's it called uh, consciousness. The Yukopnik is very, very considerate. Outside the podcast, he plays the character of a dickhead. He is so sweet outside. It. And I, I mean, yeah, we all play characters, whatever. Sorry, sorry to cut you off from the story. Um, yes, please go on. <laughs> Serenade us with the stories of, of what liberals think inclusion is. Well, and obviously I was pissed off and I immediately called their office and I'm like asking them to explain like, hey, like why on earth would you celebrate Muslims in a bar? And like, oh, well, we talked to one of our Muslim staff members and they're coming. And I'm like, okay, just because one Muslim guy drinks, what, whatever, that's his prerogative. Like that's, you know nothing, you know nothing. That's the whole thing is like, you want to save these people so badly, but you don't even understand the most basic concepts of, of the religion you're claiming to save. And of course, with these same people, they're like, oh, I support Muslims. As soon as you explain anything in the religion, they are immediately like turned off. They're like, no, I don't, what are you talking about? Don't tell me about your religion. There, there's just so much like that. I, I was called a moral hazard when I worked in the government and it was rightful because I 
went insane. I threatened people with knives. Um, I had this <laughs> giant like rose gold D20. I, I play like tabletop games and, and stuff like that. And like I like fantasy and stuff. So I had this giant D20 on my desk and I went through it at this guy who's now a um, port commissioner. <laughs> so yeah. I, I burned all my bridges <laughs> at the end of it. But it was the most maddening experience. And I hate it because I think a lot of these people genuinely believe they're doing good work, but they're all in this bubble and everyone who works for them is like living paycheck to paycheck. So they're not gonna actually speak up and say like, oh, this isn't right. This isn't actually helping people. You're not, you know, the God of this part of the world right now. Um, it, it's all very self-serving. And it's also part of the reason why um, I made this giant switch to like never focus on politics again, just be true to like my passion and what I, what I love, which is history and to continue researching and being an independent researcher for history. Um, and when I started doing things online, I, I really wanted to stay away from political things. Recently, I, I have had to touch on political things. Um, but even if you look at a lot of the um, even Marxist um, political pages and and you know not not you guys of course you guys are fine <laughs> but there's a lot of people who really rub me the wrong way because they remind me so clearly of my time in government mind you i only lasted like eight months in the state legislature um it ended pretty terribly uh I don't know if I should talk about it. I, I reported the legislator I worked for for like harassment because he was really gross. And uh, their solution, instead of moving me to an office, a different office like they did with other people before me, uh, they forced me to leave. So that's fun. Um, mm. And yes. I know it's fucked up. Uh, but, you know, I'm the Muslim. I must be quiet and obedient and not uh, challenge it in any sort of way possible. And if I, only, only reason... you were the Muslim that was like, bars are okay, then they might have actually done you a service yeah. or something. Oh. No, I was approached by like the biggest n newspaper in the city to talk about it once they heard about it. But my thing is I didn't want someone else to use my narrative for their own political agenda. So yeah. I that's the only reason I yeah. didn't go out with it. Um, but whatever, here I am. Not that it really matters anymore. Mm -hmm. Anyways. By the end of it, I didn't give a shit. And I'm not, like, I'm a bit of a, in real life, I'm a bit of like, an unhinged person that people are off put by me. <laughs> They're very off put by me, which is fine. I get it. I'm, it's, it. It's called being a Marxist. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's called having passion. I'm just a passionate person. Mm. Um, a lot of people on the internet who post about politics, they rub me the wrong way because they remind me of the very self-righteous people I worked with in government. Um, and it, it's really sad to see. And something that I wanted to bring up is that um, I think, and I'm, I'm saying this as much as to myself and to you two and to anyone else watching, I think a great way to really check yourself um, with the kinds of work that you're doing, because I think we all tell ourselves like, we're doing what we're doing, we're putting out what we're putting out because we want people to learn. We want people to understand the reality of things. We want them to benefit from what we're creating. But I would ask you, myself, anyone out there, and you should do this throughout your life because we're all, we've all been there at some point. Are you doing what you're doing because you genuinely want people to learn these things? Or are you doing it because you want to be known as the person teaching those things? And I think a lot of people have to face the harsh reality that what they're doing, be it, be it working in government as a, a liberal or, you know, putting out Marxist YouTube videos, a lot of the time it's not as, you know, the intention isn't as pure as it started. And, and people mm. are, are often doing it in a very self-serving manner to be known as that person. And, and I want to be as far away from that as possible. And history talk and history tube and the history side of the internet is a little a little bit better than than the political side by a tiny bit <laughs> as, as much as it could be on the internet yes as hakim said as much as it can be on the internet but i'm really glad you you mentioned that because when you we were talking about like your your career uh, working for the u.s state basically i think i can call it that uh you mentioned that a lot of people were motivated kind of to have tunnel vision because uh, you need to have tunnel vision if you want to stay sane and work uh, in that sector uh, and still get a paycheck. But a more important, in my opinion, motivational factor is exactly what you what you just mentioned. A lot of people genuinely think that uh, uh, what they're doing is a net good. 
Uh, they genuinely think that uh, when they wake up in the morning and go to work or make a YouTube video or start a live stream or do a podcast or in most circumstances write a very long article about something they don't know jack shit about is that they, uh, they kind of sell it to themselves that they're not doing it for themselves. So the second you start questioning the like ideological framework through which they they are reporting or making videos or writing articles or writing books uh it starts feeling like a direct personal attack and not necessarily an attack on the ideology i don't know if you guys have noticed but most people are absolutely open to uh discussing uh ideological matters or historical matters in like a bubble so we're sitting here and we're discussing an argument between uh sort of an anarchist and, for example, a Leninist approach to the the same situation. And in 99% of uh, the circumstances, the situation, the, the conversation is actually going to be a relatively civil one where the, 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 the discussion is about, like, uh, uh, you know, it's about strategy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when two people are discussing if one is wrong and the other one is right, between, again, for example, a Marxist-Leninist and an anarchist, it starts being perceived as a much more personal thing and not necessarily an ideological, uh, I don't know, arena of debate or whatever you want to call that shit. So th- what Izdihar said was very important. You really have to sometimes check yourself before you wreck yourself and f- <laughs> figure it out with yourself on what is actually motivating you to uh, to be doing this. And then when criticism comes at you, try to see if it's uh, actually criticism towards you as a person or criticism towards the the words that are coming out of your mouth. Because very often it's criticism of you as a person and not necessarily uh, the ideology you claim you carry. And often people, sorry if I'm going around, but often people immediately use that as a shield. So I'm a piece of shit and I'm, uh, I'm for example, an ML. And uh, people start uh, saying, oh my God, that guy's a piece of shit. And then I get my large group of, of followers and say, oh my God, look at these people. They're talking shit about MLs. And it just spreads in that specific way. It's a group, reactionary group think kind of thrown back uh, at itself. And it creates fandoms instead of uh, groups with actual political fervor and uh, and belief and wish for changing it's fucking pokemon cards but uh, you have different <laughs> cool uh, flags and emblems and shit exactly right but i just want to dial back a bit to, to the point of um you and working in government and i thought it's it's very interesting that um it, this is the same way with pretty much every particularly modern western capitalist uh uh, "Quote unquote democracy um, is that they require a very specific way of working and a very specific form of individual to um, adhere to a, ver- a very specific certain set of rules and regulations and what they expect of you, how how you're supposed to act and speak and and think, uh, and that system is set up only for that. And if you are slightly outside that, what their expectation, um, then you." physically cannot survive either for your own sanity or by them just deciding that hey yeah you're not a right fit for this and then they kick you out and this kind of is a um to use a silly example uh communist parties around the world would have regular purges where they make sure that the people who uh are in the party are actually you know like up to date on the theory they have read the stuff they're supposed to have read they know what the party line is on a couple of, uh, on several things they know for example the basic analysis towards their particular conditions in their country for example etc cetera, etc cetera. and the people who don't meet these criteria have to be purged out of the party because you don't meet the criteria to be in the party um, and this is kind of a passive process that happens in liberal democracies at least from what I've noticed uh, is that within the political establishment um, you have to adhere to these very specific sets of, of beliefs and and the second that you don't, you will be uh, kind of uh, shaved off either by, like we said, uh, in, for example, in the case of Izdihad, where uh, you will physically go implode if you stay there any longer, um, or <laughs> they, you have to be, uh, um, they, they kind of kick you out, which is also uh, your experience as I understand it. But let's bring it to the, or, or is there something you'd like to add to that? 
Uh, I mean, so yeah, I know I'm talking about this forever, um, but there's a third. Please do. There's yeah. a third option, which I think is that it's beat into you. Uh, I saw a lot of that. People who maybe were questioning things when they were first hired on, but they everyone I, I worked with was facing abuse on some level, be it you know mental, but sometimes sexual, <laughs> like uh, you know physical. Like like they were working for some really crazy people who are elected officials, and um, even if at first you see you know, the, the writing on the wall, it was beat into them and then they eventually submit to it and convince themselves what they're doing is yeah. right. Exactly right, yeah. And that's why it's, um, not only is the the the, um, uh, the horror of, of, of the liberal political establishment uh, not to be underestimated, uh, but also the, the um, general expectations that they would have of you, even when you're not within the system, but they want you to partake in the system, uh, so that they they have these expectations of you. Um, it's very very interesting, and uh, uh, we'll probably touch on this a bit later towards the end. Uh, but I'd like to get, if it's okay with you guys, to the to the um, uh, core topic that we want to talk of today, which is um, the general uh, attitude towards uh, Soviet minorities. And I don't like using the word minorities because it has a lot of American connotation. And I was hoping that you could actually comment on that as the hard the, the how what a what was an ethnic minority in the soviet union doesn't make sense in the american use of the term because you know um, soviet minorities were represented differently had political autonomy blah, blah blah all that kind of stuff so could you please uh, intro us into that right uh i maybe i don't have my own perfect definition for this um but of course, an important part of understanding the Soviet Union and even understanding theory that we're all inspired by is understanding who like, who was Lenin talking to, right? Who was Stalin talking to? What made up the Soviet Union? How can you truly understand what we're reading and learning about if you don't even know who lived there? Um, because alongside um, the Slavic people of the Soviet Union, which is often more overrepresented in media and in our perception of the Soviet Union, um, there are many other different people groups. In fact, uh, I like to say about a, over 180. This number varies depending on how you want to categorize it. And sometimes the more you want to categorize it, the more problematic it gets because these are human beings. <laughs> and uh, it's it's complex, right? The way that we talk about um, the, the ethnographic division of people groups. Um, but yes, just due to the nature of the size of the Soviet Union, of course, again, going back to um, geographic literacy, if you look at a map of the mm. Soviet <laughs> Union, it is very large, the largest country, in fact. Um, and of course, there's going to be many, many different people within those borders. Um, and so for reference, though, as I mentioned, Slavs made up about um, 70 percent of that population. Um, that would be the um, Russians, Ukrainians and Belarusians. Please, for the love of God, do not say Belarus. The amount of times I've heard people say Belarus instead of Belarus oh drives me insane. <laughs> and uh, just learn the, basic, oh, the basics. Belarus. <laughs> Sorry, that fucking killed me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a, I'm only Sorry, bringing just... it up. I'm only bringing it up because it's so common, yeah. okay? <laughs> to add to that, so like, I don't know if either of you were ever into watching Eurovision. I'm a strange American who yeah. actually watched Eurovision, but one yeah, year... I watched there was this... plenty of it, unfortunately, and sometimes, so... fortunately, depends on the year, yeah. <laughs> first, of all, first of all, Belarus has been like disqualified more times than they've actually been in. And one year they had a song <laughs> that was literally called I Love Belarus. And that's the song. It's, mm. it's I love Belarus. Feel it deep inside. Like those are the lyrics. And it's so mm. good. And I don't understand why no one's made a meme out of it yet. It, it, you should look it up. I love Belarus. It's amazing. I'm sure that Alexander Lukashenko jerks off to that song. Absolutely in my head. <laughs> it is canon. All right. So we talked about the Slavic people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... <laughs> So, okay, other than like the Slavs, like uh, about 15% of the, the former Soviet Union were Turkic people. The Turkic in itself is a, is a way to describe people with a similar language. So as you can see, like it, it's hard to divide people groups. Um, and then the remaining are various other um, people groups. And it, it's hard to divide them. Like I said, um, I suppose the best way to divide them would be geographically by geographic origin. Like when I talk about 180 different people groups, these are people who are either um, indigenous or historically nomadic to these borders, right? Um, so you have like the East Slavs, as I mentioned, you have the Baltic people, the Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, you have the Central Asians or, or Turkic, the Uzbeks, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Tajiks, 
Turkmen's you have the people of the Caucasus and the Caucasus is like one of the most diverse places in the world. The, the Soviet Union was one of the most multi-ethnic states in the entire world. Um, but the Caucasus, you know, in Dagestan alone, there's like 30 different languages spoken. Um, there's so many different people groups. I can't even list them all. Uh, best I'm, weddings. Very... Best weddings. Absolutely yes. <laughs> best weddings. <laughs> yes, mm. I agree. I, lo I love Lesginka. Like, I mean, I married oh, someone nah. from the North Caucasus. So, like, I, I'm biased, right? But Lesginka is so good. <laughs> and it descends from the people, the Lesgins, who are one of the many people groups of Dagestan. Fun fact. Okay. Uh <laughs> Yeah, there's just, there's so many different people groups. There's other German, uh, there's German groups like the Volga Germans uh, and their history is interesting. There's the, um, I'm just listing off people, but there's so many and so many interesting ones. There's the Finno-Ugric people, which as the name suggests, or Finnic, they migrated uh, at some point from where Finland is. And that makes up of like the Udmurts, which are the most, uh, the, the highest percentage of gingers, the Udmurts. Um, the Mordvins and the Mari people. The Mari people are considered the oldest pagans in Europe. They have like the longest lasting pagan tradition in all of Europe because they're on the European side of Russia. But yeah, oh, and then there's the Kalmyks and Lenin was part Kalmyk. Uh, there's this weird debate. Yes. Like people think like, oh, he's Chuvash. No, he's Kalmyk. No, he was Kalmyk, yeah. not Chuvash. Though Chuvashia has the best flag, the current Chuvash Republic by far has the best flag out of any flag. As I mentioned, I'm huge into the study of flags, take my word seriously, the flag of Chivashia, yeah. there's nothing better than that. <laughs> I completely agree, yeah. yeah. But I didn't know that he was coming. I thought he was, uh, he was, uh, I didn't know it was also pronounced Chuvash, I, was I thought it was Chavish, so thank you for the correction. But I, th I thought Lenin, I didn't know Lenin was coming. That's very, very interesting to note. Yeah, the Kalmyks are interesting, right? Because they're the, the only uh, prominent Buddhist group in Europe, as in the European side of Russia. Um, and there's a lot of, I spend a lot of time on problematic forums studying things. And if you've ever been on <laughs> a military history forum, you know what I'm talking about. But um, the early Soviet uniforms, um, so pre-World War II, um, the, the symbols they used to identify the different regional groups um, was reflective of where they're from. And for the Kalmyk units, they had a swastika on their um, mm -hmm. uniform because they're they're Buddhists, they're Buddhists, yeah. right? And so you see yeah. all of these like stupid people in military forums showing off like old Chuvash, or Chuvash, sorry, old Kalmyk um, uh, symbolism on Soviet uniforms saying, see, the Soviets were Nazis. And I'm like, oh, you're so <laughs> stupid. Brilliant. No, <laughs> no. Um, but yeah, <laughs> so I, I don't know. I don't think I'm explaining uh, the people groups, but there's just so many different people. It's not just Russians. It's it's there's so many different kinds of wonderful people. Um, you have the, the Yakuts or the Saha, as they call themselves, and they live in the very coldest part of the entire world. Uh, and they're really great at the jaw harp. Um, yeah, there's just it's again, the most multi-ethnic state in the world was the Soviet Union. And I think understanding that is key in understanding, you know, the history and understanding the theory that we read, like who were these laws and who were these speeches meant for? Um, these people grew up around this ethnic diversity. They were for the most part aware, especially after um, the progression of like the railway and such. Um, everyone, everyone knew someone from Central Asia. Everyone knew, um, you know, a Yakut, like it, it's, it's important to understand this, this aspect of when we're, when we're studying the history and, and the um, theory that comes from this part of the world. Exactly right. I find that very, um, it's a conversation that uh, is always missing the nuance that you very uh, brilliantly um, uh, ex expounded on, which is that, yes, it was incredibly multi-ethnic. There were many different kinds of people. There weren't just white Slavic people, but every, almost every other uh, type of human being under the sun. Um, and that's especially after also uh, after you include the internationalism that the Soviet Union was part of um, with the like Patrice Lumumba University and other uh, such aspects. Um, very, very interesting history. Uh, yes. But one thing that I want to add as well, Oh, actually, do you want to? Have, you can say what you'd like. Oh, I'm sorry. I just popped into my head. I forgot to mention the Koryo Saram, which is another really interesting group. I just, I'm sorry. I just get really excited about this. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Be because yeah. the the Koreans, the Koryo Saram is what they're known as. The Koreans in the Soviet Union were mostly from the north. Um, and so, yeah, so Russia's or the Soviet Union's Korean population and today they're Russia's current Korean population are all primarily from the north. Um, and famously, 
uh, Victor Tsui of the band Kino, famous yeah. famous band. Kino, exactly. Um, mm-hmm. the, he he was Koryo Saram. He was Korean. So interesting stuff that people like some of the most you know influential Soviets in history belong to these groups, and so we should learn about them. Yeah, exactly right. It's incredibly interesting, um, and also the 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 uh, um, array uh, represented in the leadership at different levels of Soviet government and the, their ethnic origins is very interesting as compared to, for example, the early U.S., where it's just white guys, you know, um, despite the fact that the the land that the United States uh, stood atop was a land that included not only people of um, African origin, but also uh, people of Chicano origin, Native American origin, um, Hispanic origin, uh, and as well also uh, in, included within the Native American uh, label, all the other um, First Nations uh, people, which are incredibly diverse, especially when you, then you start including um, like Alaska, for example. And that's not even mentioning Hawaii or Puerto Rico or all these other areas. Um, but then when you re- reflect on the actual political structure in the United States and compare that with the Soviet Union, for example, you'd, you'd, you wouldn't see the same level of, of, of diversity. Um, true diversity, by the way. I don't mean like just weird affirmative action nonsense. Um, but not that there's anything wrong with affirmative action, but I mean like exactly what Izdahar was talking about. Sometimes there's some people who, you know, they just want to have the person standing behind them to be an ethnic minority so they can look good for their, you know, for their fucking electoral campaign, but they don't actually care. That's what I mean by my uh, stuff. But the point that I want to bring about all this, this this conversation of, of, of why call, saying Soviet minority sounds strange is because at the end of the day, no matter how quote-unquote insignificant, that's not the word I want to use, but just so people understand, how quote-unquote insignificant an ethnic group is within the Soviet Union, uh, no matter how small in, in amount they are and how no matter how small their autonomous re- re- republic may be, um, they nonetheless, number one, had a, a, an autonomous republic that they had uh, political representation in, um, and they could uh, govern according to their own particular, uh, the, the intricacies of their own laws um, as part of a greater, the, you know, the greater skeleton of, Sco- of Soviet uh, uh, legal uh, corpus uh, that was present in every um, republic, but also that uh, the Soviet political system was dual-tiered in that there were two, basically, major um, councils, two Supreme Soviets, um, the first, which was the Supreme Soviet that represents just everybody in the Soviet Union, and then the second, which is was the, the Soviet of Nationalities, which is specifically uh, set up so that all these individual um, uh, ethnic groups, all of them had their direct say in the political organizing uh, of the Soviet Union, uh, which is incredibly interesting, and is not something that you see um, in all the other countries around the world are, uh, well, whether uh, liberal capitalist democracies or other uh, capitalist um, uh, formations, capitalist um, uh, government formations, uh, you don't see the same kind of uh, drive to include uh, people of of non-dominant ethnic um, uh, group presentation into the the, the, the political system. It's something that is interesting to note. That doesn't mean it always worked out perfectly, but it is something that nonetheless was different and made the Soviet Union very unique. Um, But yeah. Right. It, Tying that all together. Oh. I was gonna say like exactly. No, I just exactly. You're exactly right. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> I I do need the after my fucking rants. I do need the uh, the, the emotional support because your company will either fall asleep or <laughs> or just be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Right. <laughs> well, no, 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 yeah. Oh, it's, okay. it's uh, he's the talking. Okay, sorry. I need to be back. I'm, I'm fucking around. That, that, that was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, now wake up. Now wake up. It's my turn. You gotta listen to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um. So I I like how you mentioned, of course, it doesn't mean that everything went absolutely perfect all the time. And so that's why I think it's sometimes more beneficial to express um, these sorts of things with actual like either anecdotes or like, like, you know, because you can tell people, okay, this was in the law, that this had to happen doesn't mean it's going to happen. And and so I I really want to read to you guys an excerpt um, of a speech by Stalin, because I feel like this speech absolutely um, encapsulates that and it is a speech that he made in in the 1920s um, addressing the people of Dagestan because they hadn't yet made the the, uh, Dagestan ASSR, uh, Autonomous Socialist Soviet Republic within the Russian uh, RSFSR. And um, he addresses some of the reasons 
like he, he addresses what it means to be an autonomous republic and, and this type of freedoms that the these people groups got because usually when there were you know large minorities um although Dagestan being a, a region of many different peoples um the Soviet Union did their best to create spaces where these people got to continue their traditions and continue their ways and speak their languages and uh, in many cases preserve their languages uh, for those who who lost the ability to read over time because the literacy was a problem with a lot of the corruption that happened beforehand. Um, but if you don't mind, can I read this little excerpt for you? Go right out, yeah. Okay. So the context is basically that prior to this, in 1920, the Soviet Union was, was dealing with a lot of outside factors, and now they can focus on um, the people. And so let's, let's see. Yeah, so... I will start it here. Now that it is able, thanks to the victory over its enemies, to occupy itself with problems of internal development, the government of Russia considers it necessary to tell you that Dagestan must be autonomous, that it will enjoy the right of internal self-administration while re re retaining its fraternal ties to the people of Russia. Dagestan must be governed in accordance with its own specific features, its manner of life and customs. We are told that among the Dagestan peoples, the Sharia is of great importance. Mind you, this is Stalin talking. We have also been informed that the enemies of the Soviet power are spreading rumors that it has banned Sharia. I have been authorized by the government of the Russian Socialist Federative Soviet Republic to state here that these rumors are false. The government of Russia gives every people the right to govern itself on the basis of its laws and customs. The Soviet government considers Sharia as common law, is, and it's as fully authorized as that of any other of the peoples inhabiting Russia. If the Dagestan people desire to preserve their laws and customs, they should be preserved. Um, and he later goes on to say that the Soviet government knows that the worst enemy of the people is ignorance. It is therefore necessary to create the greatest possible number of schools and organs of administration functioning in local languages. Like, isn't that monumental that in 1920, yeah. Stalin said this, that Sharia is law in the yeah. Soviet Union and the <laughs> people of Dagestan yeah. can practice that way? It definitely is. And also... Um, Again, uh, just for the people who, who who listen to this and they heard a couple of things and they're not might not be too familiar familiar with the um, uh, historical context because they heard Soviet Union, they heard Stalin, and then they heard Syria, and <laughs> yeah. those are three things. It's like boom, 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 strike shooting three, bricks so, already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Report one star, By the one, way, star one star. Yeah, yeah. If if you if you ever wondered what my person what my personality is like, it's Soviet Union, Stalin, sure. <laughs> that speech, that specific speech, is everything. Yes. Exactly, but uh, so people for people to understand, none of this is supposed to imply that the Soviet Union is perfect or Stalin was absolutely impeccable w without fault, or that, um, for example, that uh, the approach to uh, indigenous law in the Soviet Union was always without fault. But what we're trying to show is that at the very early point in the idea of, of minority uh, law or minority rights, um, uh, the Soviet Union was at least practicing or attempting uh, some level of plur plurality, of diversity uh, in approach. And that doesn't mean that in every stage of Soviet development that these things were fully um, uh, practiced. That doesn't mean, for example, at different eras there wasn't limitations uh, on what certain um, ethnic groups might want to practice themselves uh, as a result of what the Soviet government thought might be against their uh, policy towards something, educational policy or otherwise. Um, but it is, again, nonetheless very interesting to note that this was a, a feature of the early Soviet Union uh, and is something that uh, most people don't know about it, particularly uh, the, the, the relation to, to minority groups. And that's, I think, will tangent into something very interesting that I want to discuss about, which is, first of all, the positives, and then we can talk about the, the negatives, because there are quite a few negatives. But when it comes to the positives, for example, you mentioned uh, a, a beautiful example, which is this, um, the local laws and customs of the different ethnic groups were taken into account. Um, uh, which is very interesting. For example, in the United States, I believe there isn't, Sharia law cannot be considered to be Sharia law. Sharia cannot be considered to be common law, for example. Uh, I don't think even Jewish legal law can be considered to be uh, common law if you want to to uh, um, have rulings in that. I'm, not, I'm, I'm unaware, is there, do you know? Uh, I don't know, US, I'm not Jewish, I don't know. Uh, okay. 
Okay, uh, I'm I'm unsure, but I know in the UK they have some local um, thing for Jewish law, and I think they're trying to do something with allowing local Sharia courts. I'm unsure. I I, I haven't read uh, about this in a while. But even see, like in these very highly developed, quote unquote, diversity oriented, uh, multicultural uh, liberal uh, democracies, um, this is still a very new thing. Meanwhile, there was an attempt in the Soviet Union. Um, f fair enough. Let's put law to uh, to one side. Could you possibly tell us about other interesting things that uh, minorities could have benefited from? Um, or less, again, I, I hate this fucking word. I hate the word minority. Um, what other Soviet ethnic groups that were non-Russian, non-dominant, um, whether linguistically or right. anything else that you want to bring to mind? Well, yeah, like, like as I mentioned, um, la uh, languages were preserved uh, prior to um, the Russian Revolution. Uh, many of these people uh, were illiterate, right? They didn't know their own indigenous languages. The amount of people that were able to um, write in these languages was was very uh, minimal. And so there were massive um, efforts to help people not just learn Russian, but learn their indigenous uh, languages. There's a great reference book that I have specifically about the Muslim minorities called um, The Islamic Peoples of the Soviet Union by Shireen Akiner. And uh, there's a lot of great statistics in this book about um, these literacy efforts. And it has, um, it, it talks about um, through over time how uh, the percentage of people that slowly became literate in both their uh, native language and in Russian, um, among many other uh, interesting information like the amount of texts and books that were printed in these various um, indigenous languages throughout the Soviet Union. And of course that number would, would keep going up. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a lot of interesting stuff like that. And mind you, I only mentioned like this speech because I think, I think it is a shocking speech for people. This isn't meant to say like every single time Stalin was like, yeah, mm. Sharia, <laughs> do whatever you want. Um, but it, I, I think it's good to challenge our perspectives with, with these things. As, as many examples as you can find of, you know, horrible things happening, you'll be able to find really interesting and, and, and ahead of their time sort of um, efforts by the Soviet Union. It's just they're never highlighted. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I can talk about some of the negatives because I feel like some of the quote unquote negatives aren't necessarily um, accurately portrayed. Right. Um, hmm. I think a lot of people, sure a lot of people are under the impression that like the Soviet Union was this godless utopia and uh, that you weren't allowed to practice religion and all of this stuff, even though the Constitution has said since the very beginning that people have the freedom of conscience, um, the freedom to individually practice religion as they choose, though, of course, throughout the years that may change slightly, uh, especially during Khrushchev. Let's not talk about that. Um, mm. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that gets brought up a lot, especially by other Muslims, is this idea that they were um, Islamophobic and that you weren't allowed to wear hijab and like they they take these concepts from um, this this series of policies um, known as uh, uh, hujum, uh, which was this effort to um, create equality, gender equality in primarily Central Asia, where the Soviets uh, saw that there was was major inequality happening. Um, and and I, I feel like this particular campaign is often proposed as um, getting rid of Islam, which is just such a poor take because there's there's context, right? The whole idea, of there's, there's context. Um, Central Asia, uh, before the Russian Revolution, um, was, was rife with um, corruption, right? You had very wealthy, wealth hoarding, self-proclaimed muftis who um, were imposing a lot of laws in the false name of Islam. You had women who were, without a choice, forced to wear um, face veils that were not just regular face veils, they were um, heavy, you know, horse-haired veils. Um, they weren't equal in society. Um, they were, were treated poorly. No one had the opportunity to learn to read. Uh, it was it was it was horrible. Um, so people couldn't even read Quran to understand what their rights in Islam were, right? So this is the this is the the reality that they are coming from. And so when the Soviets say that they came to create gender equality, they're not saying they got rid of Islam. These people were not practicing Islam. Um, they were practicing the the man-made words by corrupt 
um, individuals that put themselves in a place of power to a population who was illiterate and could not read their Quranic rights in Islam. And um, it's frustrating because I read a lot of books on, on women's liberation in the Soviet Union, and every single one does a piss poor job at describing Islam. And they always attribute the status of these people um, to Islam. And they say, oh, you know, <laughs> there, there's this thing, the Alexander Kolontai, uh, she, Alexandra Kolontai, she um, did this this dramatic thing. She would go to different um, political bodies and councils and bring women from Central Asia in these face veils, these horse-haired, heavy face veils, and have them dramatically rip them off and call for equality. And for some reason, this is the only thing that a lot of academics and historians like to write about in regards to this, is these dramatics by Kolontai. Um, and they describe it as they were freeing themselves from the constraints of Islam. And it's just not <laughs> it's just not the reality. Like they got rid of their veils. And for some reason, people think when they say they got rid of their veils, that means they took off their hijab. They took off their face veils. And I think you it doesn't take a genius to look at any picture from the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and understand that headscarves have historically been a very important part of culture. Um, it's actually a very... I would say a proletariat <laughs> thing to wear a headscarf because it keeps your hair out of your face when you're working. There's plenty of practical reasons to wear it. And so this this mis this misconstruing of the face veil and the actual headscarf is something that is quite common when talking about um, these series of policies to create gender equality. And what's even more frustrating is that, um, again, these academics that are writing these books in English, uh, the only books that exist that talk about these sorts of things, um, they do such a piss poor job at, at you do we're doing any amount of research on Islam and assuming that they're at a university or they're funded by a university, they can't be that far from a masjid to go and ask some simple questions yeah. or they have to have some sort of like, they, I'm sure they have at least one Muslim friend that they could ask like, hey, is wearing a heavy horse hair veil over your entire face part of Islam? To which they would say, no, of course not. Um, and so it's really frustrating that even like some of the most, you know, academically acclaimed people talking about women's liberation in the Soviet Union and the English language choose to dis you know, describe Islam as something that isn't Islam and attribute the inequality in these regions to religion when that is not the case whatsoever. And so I just want to say that a lot of the negatives that we can talk about are actually large misunderstandings from various degrees. And the fact is there's just not many Muslims in this field of research correcting these grave mistakes that we have in books that are used in universities. Exactly right. I, th I find that very interesting at, the, like, of course, the, the point of perspective um, to, to understand uh, because at the end of the day, the, the, what happened in, particularly in the early Soviet era was so complex um, with many uh, interlocking pieces and then the only way we can interpret this or even read about it nowadays is through the lens of usually some like white guy who doesn't speak the local languages probably hasn't been to the area and is unfamiliar with the local customs or religions or any other uh, traditions or anything else let alone the major like Russian customs and, 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 and attitudes um, and that's not even mentioning the Soviet and socialist perspectives on these things um, so you end up with all these different complexities that end up being filtered very badly by somebody who is at best kind of a quack um, in, in at least one or several, several of these very necessary um, aspects, uh, which can result in, yeah, weird misunderstandings of, of, of what, what the Soviet experience was. Uh, but something I'd like to add as well, um, for example, the, the, the positives, uh, we can harp on about them quite a bit. I can just like list a couple um, uh, just for posterity's sake. Then we can talk more about the negatives because that's, I think, something that will be more interesting for people. Um, the positives, like we mentioned, yes, uh, recognize recognition of uh, people's uh, ethnic, uh, different ethnic groups, um, uh, political rights, uh, rights to political autonomy, rights to uh, political participation, not only on their local level, but at uh, the uh, republic level and then on the Soviet level as a whole. Um, not only this, for example, the, the uh, maintenance of local customs um, and and uh, languages. Many languages, by the way, prior didn't even have writing systems. Um, many languages in the Soviet Union had no uh, um, codified writing system, and the Soviets came and made uh, codified writing systems of or, of different types. Uh, at first, they were very uh, ambitious, and they would do things like, hey, yeah, you know, the like Arabic script and Latin script and and modified Cyrillic script. But then afterwards, in the 30s, they got a lot more practical. 
practical and they're like, hey, um, it would be much easier if we standardized Cyrillic script across all of them so that the people who learn their local languages um, and they learn their local la languages reading Cyrillic uh, will be also uh, very good at, well, reading Lush Russian later on. Uh, so it makes everybody's life easier, um, which on one hand can be seen as limiting. Uh, and for like to give an example, a lot of the Central Asian languages used to be written in the Arabic script, um, Persia Arabic script. Um, Persia, Arabic, Arbo Persia, I think is the right, ah, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, right, yes. <laughs> but then they, they, yeah, exactly. They changed it to the Cyrillic one, which uh, is a limitation in one way, but it's also pragmatic on the other. These are many different positives that, that, that existed, which are interesting and, and should be recognized. But when we talk about the negatives, I want to just list a couple of things and maybe you can just comment on them so that people know for posterity's sake. Um, the biggest thing I think, uh, is the deportations. So could you please talk about what it was, why why it happened, which ethnic groups were affected, uh, just to give the perspective, right. if you so would. <laughs> right. I mean, it's a very controversial topic to talk about. I, exactly. I, yeah. I, mean, I even don't touch on it much at all. I don't think I touch on it at all, actually, on online, just because you can be talking about something that is not related to that, and people will be like, but the deportations. Um, so... <laughs> I get I that even... all the time with my with my neoliberal Russian friends, like all the time, because there's plenty of them that are not socialist at all, and plenty of them that are hardcore Marxist Leninists that make me look like a fucking joke. But the the libs they always <laughs> really love the deportation one. So like, yeah. oh, but uh, don't you know my Jewish girlfriend? She grew up over here, and then they sent her family over there. So yes, I would love to. I would love to hear more. Well, and that's that's the fucked up thing about it is everyone is so excited to talk about people's suffering and not their achievements. Mm. Everyone knows the Crimean Tatars because of their suffering, not because of their, exactly. you know, uh, uh, what they've contributed to society or where they are, where their villages are in, in the Crimean Peninsula, like what they look like. Who, like wh no one knows anything about them other than deportations. And I think that's like the most dehumanizing fucked up thing about it all, which is why I purposely don't touch on these things. I mean, so for the most part, Deportations were supposedly, right, um, due to coll supposed collaboration with fascists, right? It was an extreme punishment towards um, people groups and families who collaborated with the Nazis, and the level of collaboration uh, didn't really matter, right? Um, and I think it's important to understand, again, with context, we're talking about um, extreme reactions due to an extreme, like, monumental loss of life that happened that is really hard to fathom. And so when we're, we're talking about the punishment for these kinds of things, I'm not saying it's good that it happened or that it was the rightful decision, but it's important to understand the emotional implications that were involved in this and what the people, people were going through after World War II. Um, and a lot of these needless uh, deaths that happened in World War II, people attributed to these people who collaborated, like the Crimean Tatars and the Chechens, for instance. Um, yeah, and so they were primarily deported to Kazakhstan temporarily, um, and the journey wasn't a good one, right? Um, that can be blamed on a number of things, uh, you know, unsuspected weather, poor preparation, um, the fact that when you're, um, tr you know, transporting an entire people group, it's not just, uh, and mind you, people say that like they, they transported the entire people just to be sure. And because if they only took away the men, then that would have been a true genocide because then how would these people groups continue on? Um, but when you're transporting, you know, an entire society, like the youngest to the oldest, babies to elderly, um, statistically, there's going to be a lot more lives lost along the way. Um, some people... Um, Again, there's a lot of linguistic manipulation in the telling of these stories. A lot of people will say that they were taken away on cattle cars, which is not true. Um, when they, my, my husband's a train boy, so I learn a lot more about trains <laughs> than I want to learn. Um, but um, according to him, the types of trains that would have been used were the same kinds of trains that um, anyone would have used to um, either move to a new city or even to transport the military. So it wasn't, you know, special cattle cars to make people suffering worse. Um, so it's important to keep your eye out to the sorts of um, linguistic manipulation that is used in these. Um, and yeah, and I'd say most more horrifically, things went down pretty bad in the North Caucasus. Um, I think it's important to understand the relationship that the people of the Caucasus have with rulers of different backgrounds. It is a um, historically um, 
geographically um, geographically important region that was always under attack. And so the people of this region are always quick to defend their land and fight back. And no one should have expected um, the Chechens and English to um, easily just go along with it. And in this process, a lot of horrible things happen, like museums and, and documents and valuable um you know, artifacts, like actual, like like ancient artifacts of the ancient Nakh people, which are only in this region, were lost forever because of the fight and the um, the way in which people were rounded up and, and forced to leave. Um, people are still digging up old family relics that uh, people are just randomly finding that were, the only way to save them was to, to bury them, right? Um, so of course there are plenty of horrible things and you can argue all night and day, whose whose fault was it? Was it Stalin's personal fault that um, the you know the people that were you know in charge of these deportations locally decided to destroy ancient artifacts and, and people's belongings and, and kill people? That can be argued you know all day and night. The fact is is that within the Soviet government there is disagreement on whether or not this should have happened, on if this was the right choice or not. Um, but the people of the Soviet Union were horrified after this monumental loss of life. And so a sort of reactionary response was was what happened. Um, you know, my family, I'm not, and I'm not trying to speak from ignorance. Like I married into a family that was very much affected by this. And my own family um, in Yugoslavia <laughs> faced a very similar fate just for being of um, German background. Though they were, you know, Germans who had been there for hundreds of years. It didn't really matter. Some of their family did collaborate and so the entire population paid the price. Um, what's even what's even worse in a lot of these cases, I know especially with the Danube Swabians in Yugoslavia after the war, I would assume it is similar with the Caribbean Tatars, the English and the Chechens, is that those who did collaborate, who were very much guilty, fled as soon as they could. And so and oftentimes those who were actually punished for the collaboration were the innocent people who stayed because they thought they had nothing to fear. They weren't guilty of anything. And they didn't think that they should leave because they're not the ones who collaborated. And unfortunately, the majority of people who suffered were those who had no dealing in these collaborations with fascists because they had already fled. Um, and yeah, I don't know what else there is to say. It's a, it's a horrible thing that happened. Um, but there's, of course, so much context all around that. And there's even more people who are just ready to get off to their suffering and use it as a, a great uh, way to shit on any positive thing that the Soviet Union also did. And I think that's what makes it a frustrating thing to touch on because um, it is just used as the scapegoat of like, okay, sure, the Soviet Union did all this amazing stuff, but uh, the deportations. It's true. And this is this is something that um, I think is very valuable to, to at least touch on, especially in like this sort of like free-flowing discussion uh, sort of context, because at the end of the day, all of us here agree, and all Marxists agree, all Marxists, by the way, who are educated on the actual history. Um, that's a very, very important point. There are people who mention deportations, but then you ask them to point uh, uh, Crimea on a map, and they're going to fucking, I don't know, point to Greece or some shit. What is um, an English? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's. A, by the way, you probably mentioned this. I bet you several people who are listening to this who have no idea what a Chechen is let alone in what Ingusia is. So, yeah, Ingushetia. Which is a shame. Ingushetia. Ingushetia. Sorry, sorry. Ingushetia. Um, so, no, no worries. Because in Arabic, we, we just say Ingush. That's why. Well, even, um, even Chechen is, yeah. is like bandit in our, in like Arabic, right? Like there, there's a word for them. Uh, what, what I really want to touch on when it comes to uh, talking about deportations in general is when uh, it was a policy, quote unquote, implemented in the Soviet Union, then it's seen as a direct consequence of the given system, the mode of organization, the leadership on the top brass, etc., etc. But uh, for, what about uh, deportations that happen literally every day, where especially in Central and Eastern Europe, between 1 to sometimes even 3 to even 4%, for as much as I know in Moldova, of the population is lost on a yearly basis because of a systematic reason called poverty induced by neoliberal reforms and capitalism. You do not need a government body to come in and tell you, pick up your shit and fucking leave. But you are when you are economically not inclined, but forced to go look for a job, go look for employment, go look for a manner or in a way through which you can feed your family, usually your parents back home. But very often it's just a husband or just a wife that goes so that they can send money back to the 
husband or wife and and two to three kids or one kid why is this uh, not uh, defined as quote unquote a deportation but just a natural migration flow of people looking for better opportunities and so on literally these same places that we're talking about are getting sucked dry both through migration but also because of incredibly low uh, sometimes close to zero which is so- supposed to be absolutely impossible in places where you have high mortality rates close to like uh, at one or maximum of 0.7 to 1.5 uh, uh, like uh, reproduction rates which means that literally the country is dying and suffocating on itself when that is happening because of uh, because of uh, the neoliberal world order it's it's yeah. not a political issue it's just again sorry for repeating myself but just i want to impale it into mm-hmm. into uh, into our listeners that the, the way something is usually put on a platter at you and if it's so incredibly simplistic you need to understand that uh, if it is only applied to one part of the world when it's being introduced the way it is and it isn't applied to another one, there is a uh, very often ideological, but uh, most times even if it's not, I mean, everything is ideological, but mostly there is a material uh, reason why why it's being sold as such. And therefore, emigration, massive emigration from Central, Eastern and Southern Europe, for example, is uh, is not seen as a massive tragedy, but uh, as something that is absolutely, absolutely normal of uh, uh, cheap labor barbarians going to help build the good civilized German houses, you know? Exactly. I, I didn't complete what I was trying to say, but that's a very good point for me, Gopnik. Um, but what I was trying to say is uh, for those who have actually read about the history, um, uh, all Marxists who uh, look at this, it's across the board unanimous that this was a mistake, a major yes. mistake that deserves to be heavily criticized. Um, because I, I need to say this because, the, I again, not to insult the intelligence of our audience, but if one person even gets that thought in their head that, you know, then we failed in, in, in what we're trying to do, um, that we do criticize this event. But there are certain, like... Um, uh, circumstances around the event that also need to be explained um, and you have to have the full context uh, but yes this was definitely a strategic uh, mistake on the part of the Soviets it re- deserves to be rightfully and t- severely criticized not only is this a failure of, of uh, just on like on a humanity basis but even when you think about it from a Marxist perspective because uh, we're materialists at the end of the day um, at least politically and when we look at this um, we see that it makes no sense why a population, if a small aspect of them had contributed, it means that all of them should be punished because the small aspect of them usually were those who were either petty bourgeois uh, intelligentsia or former landlords or, or capitalists or people of, of that ilk, basically. Um, and uh, the the regular working people of those particular ethnic groups, uh, the proletariat, would not have had anything in common with these Nazi hordes that come by and would not have ended up aiding them in their... Um, or at least not very much um, in, in, in this collaboration effort. So this was a mistake. And also it's interesting to to uh, contrast that with the um, treatment of much larger ethnic groups that had much larger aspects of collaboration that didn't have similar treatment. For example, Ukrainian groups. Um, there was a very significant Ukrainian contingent at the very west of, of Ukraine um, that collaborated heavily with the, the Nazis. But you don't see for example, Soviet deportation of Ukrainians, uh, because they fundamentally understood that the material basis of the proletariat uh, and peasantry of Ukraine was not in line with what the so what the Nazis um, uh, wanted. They would not have supported them, um, and that's why the the strange. It, I find it strange um, in how raw, the, the, how how strong uh, how large the mistake was uh, of the uh, Soviet government at this time that they seem to have managed to understand this regarding much larger populations like the Ukrainians, but completely failed when it came to Chechens or Crimeans or anybody else. Um, right. uh, yeah, so it was just a, a little a little uh, tidbit. Well, um, but that's, sorry, go on, yeah. And, and I think, you know, it's something to consider when looking at any sort of historical event is you need to look at like the accounts of the people who went through this. Um, of course, some these sorts of events made a lot of, of these populations lose confidence 
in the Soviet Union. Um, and even, you know, and so there's going to be an array of opinions, no matter what. And I always say, you know, if, if two people go through the same exact historic event in the same room, even, they're going to come out of it with two different perspectives and two different understandings of what happened. And the story that get, gets told or translated into your language is going to depend heavily on, um, you know, your country's um, motives. And so you can find um, you know, I, I've seen interviews with with um, those who went through Chechen deportation, who are still staunch communists, and they're just like, you know, it's it's awful. This sucks that it happened, but I understand why. Um, and and that's that's kind of the narrative you find from um, a lot of the really staunch communists out of the region is that they they think it's horrible, but they they understood why it happened as much as they hate, hated that it happened. Um, and there are plenty of people that they could go through, you know, the slightest inconvenience and, and they would end up with an interpretation that is, you know, my government's awful. Um, and so it's really important just to consider that the accounts that you will read that have been translated into your language are going to vary on what the, the motivation was for that translation and what the narrative they were trying to build from that. And to assume, and this is a, a key a key part of, of humanizing populations is that there's there's an array as many people as there are that are affected there are that many different perspectives about what happened to them and it's really dangerous to try and um blanket an entire people group with one narrative or one perspective because it's very um dehumanizing so of course um even the most supportive of their government critique what has happened um the way that they view it uh, is going to vary. And I think it's a very um, Russian and Eastern European perspective, but the common, uh, what I hear from people, the very common mentality is, well, everyone was suffering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But but you can't, you can't give a complex and non-black and white uh, analysis uh, of an entire time period because it doesn't fit into, what was it, uh, 800 to 1,000 uh, words per article and between every 150 you need like seven eight banners to sell people uh crack cocaine induced coca-cola so uh there's there's a very obvious reason why it it rarely happens and it's because actually diving deep uh is in nobody's uh, direct material interest. Nobody wants to read that. Nobody wants to get to know any of it. And when you do, then you're, uh, you know, a nerd on the topic or, or whatever other slang term you want to use. And I also find it very interesting that, uh, again, a point really nicely highlighted by Zahar is that um, uh, we see this, uh, these these ethnic groups are practically invisible, or or you don't ever hear about them in the common understanding of things, unless it it comes time to criticize the Soviet Union, in which they're kind of taken and brought Tokenized, up as this like token yeah. card of oh yeah, but what about X minority group um, and they suffered, and then afterwards, right after that, they just shut down this conversation, and there's no other um, interaction with this concept of of, of you know like uh, Crimeans or or whoever else, um, which I find very pathetic and very telling of the liberal, um, you know, the not exactly tokenizing of, of the suffering, I think, minorities just for political ends without actually caring about them or thinking about them. Uh, typical liberal playbook bullshit, um, which is exactly what you mentioned, the, the Muslims being called to the bar <laughs> to celebrate the, the Muslim ban uh, being lifted thing. Um, absolutely, uh, yeah, um, ridiculous. But uh, with with all this said, I think uh, we can we can actually uh, something I, I I want to get your opinion on because you see it sometimes. I think there's even a book with this title. What do you think of the term the Soviet Empire? Please <laughs> give me give me your uh, the perspectives. Right. So I think it's important to point out that the Russian Empire was very much an empire, and the Soviet Union was dealing with the remnants of that. And I think it's strange to um, associate land claimed by the Russian Empire with the Soviet Union when they were just transitioning over, right? And also the the the, the treatment of people was was vastly different. Um, I, I just I think people don't understand the sequence of Russian history, and they just like miss um, the actual Russian Empire that you know previously. <laughs> existed before the Soviet Union. It wasn't like the Soviet Union came into existence and then they took all the land. Um, the, the land was already, you know, there and, and, and claimed and, and they dealt with what they were given at the time. 
yeah, and I was expecting much more uh, rantiness because I hate this term. But it, of course, yeah, you you gave something level headed, uh, level headed, and sensible and and, and educational. So yeah, I guess I'm the, <laughs> I'm the jackass here. But I'll, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll do the venting thing. I fucking hate this this term because again, it it insinu the complete lack of understanding of what the Soviet Union is. Um, not only this, but it's trying to give you an image of like, ooh, some evil. You know, imagine like it's always like a tall, like pointed shoulder, uh, very pale vampire looking guy who also looks kind of you know stereotypically jewy in a very nazi way and standing over an earth and there's like a fucking red octopus on top of it this is what you, the image you get of ooh soviet empire fucking you know it's so wait wait you're you're right? it always sorry but you're literally describing yeah. like um russophobic Russo art that was created yeah. for the russian <laughs> empire like there's literally yeah. an art piece yeah. that is just like that but it's in the time of the russian empire it's like these it's all exactly. mixed up yeah exactly right they don't understand the continuity of the history but not only this they're trying to get a particular image of hey yeah this wasn't a mu incredibly complex uh union of many sovereign republics it was like this you know ooh, moscow with its tentacles all over these areas and they just fucking they said the word and everybody did it um and uh have any if anybody ever bothered to read into the minutes of like local discussions and how sometimes people would just say no and then they would have to send a guide like a delegate to go talk and convince people like this stupid like a factory would say no this happened in in early soviet history there's the um, what's it called um uh, right after the civil war um there was a uh, a, a central committee um uh memorandum i think is the english term uh that was sent to a bunch of like railroad um workers around the south the kuban region and stuff like that um because they're like hey yeah we're retooling after the civil war so uh, you're not gonna be doing uh so much arms lugging around basically uh you we're retooling for civilian infrastructure and they're gonna be working with like coal and and and, and iron and steel and shit like that basically that, that, that was the, the gist of it um and uh, the this was a very important because it was part of the early industrialization effort had details details right but uh so they send the memorandum and they basically literally get like lol no which is basically <laughs> they, that's the answer that they get um and they have end up having to basically send a, a delegate that's supposed to discuss what the soviet strategy towards this was and then of course the people were convinced uh, and, and that was fine but i'm just saying like this is spits right in the face of the idea of some fucking empire or whatever. Again, that's not to say that the Soviet Union was always perfect or that there was no, like, you know, directives that were sometimes, like, sent down and be like, hey, shut up and just do this. Um, but you can't uh, uh, minimize a 70-year-long uh, project, which was as infinitely complex as it was uh, in all its moving parts that the Soviet Union was, uh, into, like, oh, yeah, you know, 10 guys in a room in Moscow said, do this, and then the entire country did that. It's so fucking stupid. All right, that's my rant right. uh, over about this. <laughs> well, I, I like that you mentioned this sort of interaction that um, the government, uh, you know, governmental organizations and commissions had with the, the average people, um, because I'm right now I'm doing a lot of research on the Religious Affairs Commission, um, which is a thing in the Soviet Union. Um, and to do this research, I often go through actual documents. There's this website, it's the Electronic Library of Historical Documents of Russia, and you can, anyone can access this through, it's like docs.historyrussia.org. Um, and they have scanned like every single document ever from various different commissions. And like even just going through um, the, the Religious Affairs um, Council and, and all its iterations, because there were multiple iterations, um, you know, there's thousands and thousands of documents and I just click on random ones to go through because there's just so many. And I just read this one where uh, they were trying to get like the German, this is from like the 1970s and the, they were trying to get the uh, religious German communities in Siberia to, um, to what's the word? Basically notify their uh, commission that they were followers of certain faiths and what, what churches they belonged to. Um, and in this document, they express why they want to know these things. It's like, hey, we need to know these things to make sure that there isn't like um, like talks of extremism. So we know how many uh, books and like, like different sorts of religious uh, letters you're going to be allowed to print because we need to know how many followers you have in your parish so we can allot for that in your allowance of, of religious literature. Um, and so it's really interesting because when you look through these documents, you see these really average, reasonable interactions 
Um, even under premises, you might be like, oh, why do they need these religious people to like register? It's like it's it's because they had problems in the past <laughs> with, you know, extremism mm -hmm. and, and with people using religion to, um, you know, go against uh, to, to rise up against things in, in very brutal ma matters, manners. Um, and so you see really clearly in all these documents exactly what their intentions were with these various uh, governmental organizations and how they, they worked. And this, this is accessible to anyone. Anyone can go to, you know, docs.historyrussia.org and, and translate these documents easily and see for yourself like what they were doing and the kinds of interactions they were happening. And you'll find that it was for the most part, um, very, very reasonable. And again, of course, different cultural contexts and different uh, periods. Um, a person living in a very uh, politically stable European social democracy in 2022 uh, will hear certain things like religious allowance for, for allotted allowance for uh, printing of certain books or whatever. And they're like, oh, this is like strangely restrictive, uh, which yes, you'd be right. But then you have to think about the, the time frame. Historical uh, which, context. For example, yeah, exactly. Um, you need to realize that in different periods, for example, if the Soviet Union were around today, then you can be incredibly certain that the things would be very different. And of course, they would most likely have uh, developed, um, uh, uh, is that the right word, developed? Developed a turn for, 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 the, for the better, um, because that was kind of the trajectory of, of uh, the Soviet Union, especially towards minority rights. Um, um, Actually, that's again not the right way, but a nice way. Yeah, of but it, 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 uh, none of this, I'm none of that matters because today in the states, if you're creating a re religion, you gotta register it as an LLC so that you can get your allowance, which in the U.S. terms is to not pay tax. I mean, it's it's this it, similar thing, which is just a different spin. But when it's done in certain se sections of society or in certain geographical areas, it's normal and it's part of existing in a state and it's part of you know civilized society and this is just how it goes but when the same thing just with different lettering and different expression is done somewhere else with, with, with the bad people then you know it's it's uh, sprung as if it's uh, you know Stalin walking in with a big spoon and KGB grabbing you by the balls <laughs> sorry is the yeah. an inside joke it's fucking <laughs> weird but yeah it's, uh, it's just it's, it's always we always come back to this I mean be it a historical context cultural context economic context the ideological blah blah, 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 blah. It's always the two places doing a very similar thing. Just you you call it the decrepit, horrible, uh, crazy shit when it's uh, done here and economically viable and a normal part of the civilized society in another. It's just, like, just pisses me off. Sorry. Uh, I mean, bit, I uh, actually... Screaming in the mic. Yeah. I get it. But like, I, and honestly, I find a lot of the like Soviet restrictions on religion to be in my favor even like I don't want people proselytizing to me like I've made my own personal religious decisions and I don't want people to be allowed to like try and convert me to something else I think it's reasonable to limit the amount of you know literature that is meant to convert people to your faith and with not the greatest intentions so I don't know I think even with like these you know scary words like oh no they're limited like if you just read like just read the documents and it's really not that crazy or mm. far from anything that happens exactly. in the u.s that and the things that do happen in mm. the u.s that are allowed because they don't have restrictions like this pisses everyone off um and that's why it's very very important to always understand historical context understand why these things happened and of course again 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 to reiterate for the hundredth time um none of this is supposed to imply that there are certain things that the soviet union didn't do incredibly wrong and that they should be rightfully criticized for not only the soviet union yugoslavia cuba vietnam almost every socialist country um and uh, also just bringing to attention that the united states uh, has something that's similar even worse is not what about it is it's bringing context relevant context so people can again understand the the, the general here he uh, goes again do yeah. do do do, do. <laughs> just for context i always but, fuck with hakim because he's always yeah. like the nice <laughs> <laughs> little cute little soul whose cheeks I'm gonna snip right off of his beautiful little chubby, but probably not chubby, but very chiseled face. Uh, mm, yes. Believe it or not, I, I do listen to your podcast. <laughs> ah, you, okay, if it's hard I'm glad, to believe, I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm, I listen to I, I, it for I'm fun. Glad somebody does. I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I'm a fan. You don't have Hakeem, to. Explain. There's actually one person I'm that good. listens to this. I am actually amazed. Hey, okay. hey, I, um, I'm in awe. I am. We, we I am inflate our numbers so hard, pay for so many bots. We have like what is it now? It's around 750 different credit cards to inflate our, our Patreon. <laughs> it's it's, it's Patreon. a big scheme. But Wait, am I the only one? I'm the only one who's listening. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's just you in a room. All the <laughs> yelling at NPCs, you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, fuck. Well, we've well, always yeah, that's, directed that's this whole thing right. towards you, Izdihar, just to get you over as a guest. Mm-hmm. So the, when this episode exactly. never gets published and no episode in the future, you will see that this is the truth. <laughs> it, it was, it was just some strange hallucination. It's going to be so, some so, strange so, hallucinations. No, this episode just two doesn't fan come boy, out. Just two fanboys that wanted to talk to you and, uh, and that's it. It just died. Like it's, you never hear from it again. <laughs> You're like, did they even record? You can't oh, yeah. find your, the file on your computer. It's just everything is erased. Mm-hmm. The two hours from from your day or, you're, or disip- you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna leave your home later today and then you're just gonna see everything's a liminal space <laughs> <laughs> you're an infinite time loop this is all a, this is all a simulation all right uh, i was gonna say to, to to wrap up of course this was more of a i guess introduction to uh is the hard thought? I don't know what to word because we touched on so much. I can the come back. I can come back. States. Yeah, exactly. The the Soviet general Soviet historical tidbits, um, aspects of, of uh, historical research. Uh, they're just a nice eclectic mix. Very interesting. To be to be, to be uh, it's super now, like. The, the, sorry for interrupting. Like even on the absolute basic. Uh, what what I hope people get out of uh, everything that we talked about, and I'm pretty sure, I'm 100% sure actually that we're gonna have is the her uh, here again to talk about like more specific, for example, cultural groups or more specific events which occurred, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for as an Eastern European, like we, as as cliche as it sounds, it is an incredibly complex part of the world which has had experiences other than horrible uh, catastrophes actually occur here and it's genuinely very cool to uh, be be humanized by someone who actually I can listen to and I can feel not only understood but I know this is going to sound so cliche I'm like coming out of a movie but feel seen so if, if one thing is left with let's suck my dick you piece of shit so if, if one thing <laughs> if one thing is uh, <laughs> is uh, like <laughs> remains in people's my, now my brain is going all over the place if one thing rem- uh, rem- uh, is learned from, from this episode is that uh, not only this region but any region on planet earth is far mm. more complex complex than uh, than you can probably ever imagine and people spend their whole mm. lives learning about i don't know fucking 50 square kilometers in, in like yeah. s- rural bulgaria and they can't find uh, mm. everything that one can know so never go around exactly. with the fucking cockiness that you fucking you know yeah. understand uh, very often even groups that you never met but sometimes also mm. groups that that you did very much so meet you know the more you know the more yeah. you know you know nothing mm. yep Exactly. And not to go all parenti, of course, but the second, of course, it's always like this, the second a, a former white guard or some former landlord or capitalist or some fascist collaborating piece of shit gets round up and shot, all of a sudden the liberals will decry to fucking to the skies the, the, the great loss that, that, that had uh, been uh, undertaken. But they won't even bring to mention the millions upon millions of people who have for the first times in their life been able to read, given the ability taught the ability to read written fucking word in uh, for a lot of them in latin in uh, scripts for languages that never had writing in the very first place these people had their entire minds and, and perspectives and lives widened and expanded by ability to enjoy everything from theater and read opera to books within their own languages having their own authors and their own poetry um, in their own autonomous republic which sent its own autonomous political delegates to a particular uh, so um, council of nationalities that could take a direct part in the running of their this is you can this goes the native americans in the united states don't have this this is just a, my point okay that's it <laughs> beautiful as always uh, right. but i think like hakim i think we have very opposite uh, perhaps perhaps we have opposite ways of going about things cuz i if you've noticed i really try to like avoid going too like technical as far as like the, the, the stern structure of um, the Soviet Union and the different uh, elements of the government. I just, some I don't know, I, I feel like something's more powerful about like, re- instead of explaining how things were, like reading a speech from Stalin that is like so humanizing and like and like gentle and, and caring about the Sharia of all things. Like I, I, I like going that sort of avenue, um, but yeah. 
yeah, I, I, and I think that's that's why we need both our, our, our approaches because I'm very anal about things and you actually have a heart. <laughs> so yes, <you> can, <laughs> that's a way to connect. put it. Yeah, <laughs> you, that was great. Exactly. Is, you the heart, is the heart <laughs> and you are an anus. I agree. Absolutely. Okay. Exactly right. <laughs> I'm now the, I'm the new American of the trio. Screw JT. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. I'm the liver. Yeah, we, I'm we, the liver. <laughs> 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 oh, fuck. It's failing. <laughs> oh, fuck. Oh, happy but yes, all right. Uh, I think we can wrap up with just one little tidbit because I mentioned you—you you had one TikTok and it stood out to me, which is the weirdest thing that you found in books. Um, uh, and I thought you—you uh, you must have had several of these things. So I'm just wondering. Give us, give us examples. Right. Maybe. Well, well. Shout out to <laughs> thrift books, which I spend much money. Well, actually, I have a lot of points on thrift books, so I get a lot of books for free now. <laughs> um, but I'm constantly. <laughs> getting uh, secondhand books from eBay and thrift books and sometimes Abe, but Abe tends to be more expensive. Um, and a lot of them are like retired library books that no one wants anymore. Everyone thinks that reference books about the Soviet Union, they don't need to carry anymore because the Soviet Union's gone, but yet the information is still important. So eh, so I collect them. I collect these forgotten and, and hated books. Um, I think in that TikTok, <laughs> I mentioned finding like a little, just like a random map that had no yeah, like relation or something <laughs> no relation cotton, to the... cotton it was cotton <laughs> yeah yeah um i don't know i think i don't really find funny things i find infuriating things like i find people who are who think they're clever who read the book before me that highlight like all the worst things that i disagree with like everything that i'm looking for is not highlighted and everything that anyone who wanted to shit on the soviet union is highlighted uh and i feel like that's telling like learning about the former uh, owner of the book who had a very different perspective and was actually showing me how they were going to manipulate the information in the book. And that's really interesting. But what I find more often than not is just um, people's notes and highlights that are used perhaps for nefarious reasons to um, <laughs> illustrate the Soviet Union as that big, bad, evil thing. So that's not a fun mm. note, but I, I don't think I found yeah. anything. No, no, it's funny in, yeah. a, in a book. Hey, yeah. look, w w one day in the future, uh, all my books are gonna pass into strange hands, and they're gonna open it up, and they're gonna be like, "There's some schizophrenic. <laughs> what? Who is, what are these? <laughs> there are like entire diatribes. There are like page long rants <laughs> in the margins <laughs> sometimes on some shit, and sometimes I just angrily write these like, "You're such a fucking liberal." <laughs> For like okay, um, there's what was it? oh god, there's a book. I think it's Michael Michael Lowy Lobi, whatever his name is. Uh, his book on on Guevara uh, and his political thought. And this guy is hell bent on trying to make Guevara Trotskyist. Basically, he is pulling at such straws to try to get this this perspective. It's it's very weird, yeah. And I remember like all his little points. Like okay, one of his pieces of uh, you know one of the, like strong evidence for him, I guess, um, is that one of the books that uh, Guevara owned was um, the Revolution Betrayed. Um, I own Berdiga. Doesn't mean I, I own the Mein Kampf, bro. <laughs> like the fuck? Yeah, exactly. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay. What the? F it's. Yeah, fuck. Or don't even get me started about shit that's like purely liberal thing. I remember um a uh, acquaintance. Uh, I was I would say relative, but this person has now become an acquaintance because they gifted me this book. Um, which is I think it's called Poor Dad, Rich Dad, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, something like that. With some yeah um uh, snake oil salesman, a sale, uh, salesman um trying everybody to, in the know, company the, I work yeah fucking yeah. read that thing. Fucking everybody. Yeah. It's fuck. Do you want me? Do, do, you, yeah. do you do you want me to actually take it out and read the story? Stupid blurb that, that I wrote. Did, is that in, would that interest anybody? Hold on. Fuck. Give me a sec. I'm just gonna get it. Fuck. What it, is this like some 48 laws of power shit or what? Yes. 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 Basically, yeah. It's okay. even worse somehow. Hold on. Give me a sec. Two hours later. Okay. Let's see. Um. Okay. This is just. My, uh, by the way, I I, I I end up writing. Uh. What's it called? Um. I want to call them reviews, but like just things for me for my future. If ever if I ever want to reread a book, so I write some bullshit at the very beginning. <laughs> and this the rich dad poor dad thing. I just wrote. I'll call this capitalist fi fiction in genre filled with platitudes, common sense, mist but mystified to the fuck did I write? Elongate a useless work and a whole lot of questions slash outright wrong opinions. Very unimpressed. Filled with such gems as the poor are to blame for their uh, poverty and just get real just get real estate investment. <laughs> so fucking stupid. But yeah, and I, I'm remembering the book really. It's One part of it is like, yeah, just get like, you know, 
get rental properties because you know as a middle uh, as a, as a, a middle aged person in the United States who's working a, a, a what's it called a, a minimum wage job right you can just get rental properties it's not you know brought to you by a guy that uh, declared bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, and then I have stupid little notes all throughout the book where I highlight, for example, um, yeah, like stupid shit that he said. Huh. I don't leave notes. Like, I never write in books, and I don't even take notes when I read, which is, I, maybe it's weird, but I always felt like people, I always thought people were performing when they took notes. Like, I always thought it was just something people did to look like they're retaining information, but I never take notes for anything. I just selectively remember things, and... Uh, yeah, I don't know. But like, I read books every day all the time for research. Um, but on top of the books I read for research, I read a lot of like fantasy books. And those are the only books I ever like actually review <laughs> on like Goodreads and mm. stuff. <laughs> so it's like all my entire yeah. life revolves around like reading books about life in the Soviet mm. Union. But the only books I find worthy to write a review about are like a book where someone fucks mm. a monster because I read a lot of monster romances. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, you, you do you. All you power do to you. you. No, I completely get it. But it's like my brain works like like that. Like I can't take notes on like history, even though my life revolves around it. No, hey, if you can believe it's uh, all of I did med, med school without ever fucking taking a single. I think I took a single page of notes in all of med school. Okay, um, so you get it. Everything else I would type up or something. Yeah, yeah. I never took yeah, yeah, notes yeah, yeah. as well. Um, yeah, yeah. But mine is because studying business administration and political science is easy as fuck so it, it, it no you didn't need those um, it's just opinions I'm, 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 yeah it's just opinions yeah. i'm i'm boosting hakim's ego because yeah. he believes being a doctor is the only profession on planet earth all the others are just larpers no. sitting in front of keyboards no. smashing their hands into the thing and okay. saying, saying you're, like, you're craig you're shit, yeah. did you get those spreadsheets ready and him saying yes bob i have those spreadsheets here let me email them spreadsheets should I CC the project manager? Yes, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> right? That's what you think. You can, no, no, no. I'm fucking you wrong. You cannot lie to me and tell me your my, job. My, uh, you, you cannot tell me, lie to me and tell me your job is not that. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm Unfortunately, no, I wish it was. No, man. Uh, <laughs> my, mine looks super schizophrenic because I only, uh, I'm all the time out somewhere. Uh, and But I never bring physical copies of books with me. But every time I buy a book, I buy it print and digital. And I do write, I don't write down notes. But uh, for example, if I read a chapter, I want to have at least one full page. I follow it in my brain of like underlined aspects, which I think that if I go through the book later on, it's going to explain the whole chapter to me in the quickest way to remind me what it's about. But what happens is I only do that while at home. And then when I'm out somewhere, I'm reading on my phone usually right so you if you open any of my books they're like okay you go through 10 pages there's underlining and then there's like 30 pages with no underlining and then there's 10 pages of underlining then 100 with none and then three pages underlining it looks like somebody was like okay i need to make people think that i read this so like okay let's just underline <laughs> some shit go through the fucking thing and then put it in my in my um, library or whatever and i have books that i buy physical and and digital and i never open open the physical one and they just stay there and I'm like she's really hope someone doesn't come in and like pull it out cuz I'm going to look like the biggest poser <laughs> on planet earth honestly no I, I completely I <laughs> I completely get it I know people who do have, have you seen these people who basically they buy books and what they do is they go and they put them in a shelf but they put the you know the spine actually has the name and the author they put it backwards so you yeah. just see the white or the beige oh, class. of the fucking and it's like oh cuz it's because it's aesthetic I'm like why get the books even then you fucking dicks um usually they get garbage though they get like harry potter and they turn it around i'm like okay yeah that you would want to turn around you should turn around you'd be ashamed I love hotel that lobbies with trash. massive libraries and it's all fake books like it's all fake yeah. books if yeah, you yeah. It, it's just like oh cardboard. when they're fucking glued that's yeah, more honest yeah, yeah. but it's more honest you know it's like okay we're doing it for the aesthetic kind of be a waste of the book to actually have an actual book i don't know what's more uh What's less insane? That's the word. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, and with all that said, uh, this has been a lovely, brilliant podcast. We've uh, discussed many different uh, topics. We touched on, uh, at least to different extents uh, and different depths, on many, many topics uh, that uh, we'd love to have uh, Istahar back on to, to discuss even further in the future. Um, so, uh, having said all that, Istahar, can you add, let people know where they can find you, what things that you want to shout out, just yeah, whatever you like. 
Right. So I'm mostly, most prominently on TikTok, I, I know. Uh, and that is The Lady Is Dahar. Everywhere else, you can find me under Lady Is Dahar on YouTube and Instagram. And also, if you search or click the link below, I have a Patreon, which is also Lady Is Dahar. Beautiful. You can find all the links and everything else down in the description thing or in whatever other, uh, in all the podcast uh, platforms. Yeah, <laughs> fuck me. I'm so bad at, at signing off. It's always JT that does this. Um, with hey, come on. Said, I do it as well, been... motherfucker. Jesus, you see, this is Slavic erasure. <laughs> Slavic erasure. Right that is true. You have a video on that, don't you? Uh, nah, I mean, you yeah, barely, kind you, of. You, yeah, you, yeah. You, no, slightly, you slightly yeah, touch on more it. As they mention yeah. us in a bit too much. Anyways, uh, with that being said, this has been the D program. I'm Hakim. I'm Mr. Hart. And I'm Yugopnik. <laughs> Thank you for listening.